Hi class. Uh, so last time we talked about the uh, we talked about a general overview of theories of crime or criminality, and we talked about the classical school and the positivist school. And if you'll recall, the theory that we ended with uh, with the positivist school, uh, they basically they started using the scientific method to determine what causes criminality. So they're focused. Uh, they were focused on these biological theories of criminality. And so their search and their work was kind of, you know, leading in that direction. Um, so we're going to take up that thread and look at uh, some of the theories that came out of that school, uh, but came a little bit later. So one theory of criminality that was very popular in uh, the 1940s and the 1950s was this idea of body types. And by the way, the original research that was done here uh, was actually with juvenile delinquents, uh, not adults. But uh, following this positivist tradition, uh, the researchers, specifically William Sheldon, went into these institutions and he had pictures taken of uh, these juveniles and he looked at what type of body and uh, facial features were common in these juvenile detention facilities. And this is known as somatotyping or somatotype theory. Um, and according to the theorist William, William Sheldon, uh, what he suggested is that, you know, your body type uh, really tells us a lot about you and that there's this correlation between what type of body you have and uh, what type of person you are. So it's really this uh, bio, biopsychosocial constitutional typology here. And again, um, you know, the theorist was William Sheldon and the work he did was very popular in the 40s and the 50s. And in fact, courts during this time commonly used this body typing in order to determine if um, a troubled child needed to be institutionalized. Um, so they took this theory, you know, quite seriously. And in fact, it was actually really, really uh, well respected at the time even though when we get into it, uh, you'll see that, you know, maybe with your 21st century mind here, you might think, well, wow, that's pretty crazy. But at the time, the theory was actually pretty well respected. Um, so let's get into this idea of Sheldon's three body types here. So the first um, type of body that Sheldon claimed there was, was the mesomorphic body type or the mesomorph. And this type, this body type included a predominance of muscle, bone, and motor organs, large trunk, heavy chest, large wrists and hands, and a lean rectangular outline. And according to Sheldon, uh, this person was very active, assertive, aggressive, and unrestrained. So very impulsive type person. The second body type, that second um, body type that Sheldon came up with was the ectomorphic body type or the ectomorph. And he claimed that the ectomorph had a predominance of skin, uh, was lean, fragile, delicate body, small bones, droopy shoulders, small face, sharp nose, and fine hair. And according to Sheldon, <clears throat> this person was sensitive, distractible, and had insomnia, skin troubles, and allergies. <clears throat> and the third last body type was the endomorphic body type, or the endomorph. And this person had a tendency to put on fat, uh, had soft roundness of the body, soft tapering limbs, small bones, and velvety skin. And according to Sheldon, this person was relaxed, comfortable, um, loved luxury, and was an extrovert. So now those are the three body types um, that Sheldon came up with. And Sheldon's original work was only done uh, with males, which is why you see pictures of males here. But uh, this was later applied to females as well. And, you know, although he did use the scientific method to classify these body types, you can see that he used a wide range of, you know, a wide and overarching range of these personality characteristics 
that he claims are associated with this body type. So while he may have scientifically cataloged types of bodies, uh, but he made some pretty big inferences, inferences in terms of the personality that was associated uh, with those body types. So what did we find uh, with Sheldon's body types? Well, the research generally shows that criminals are more likely to have a mesomorphic or a mesomorphic endomorphic body. Um, so there is a relationship between body type and juveniles. Um, you are seeing here in these institutions, this relationship between the body type and the types of individuals that you are seeing in these institutions did exist. Um, and in fact, other people came along and applied it to females and found pretty much the same, pretty much the same thing. But one thing to keep in mind here is that these findings are significant, uh, but they're not large in magnitude. So in other words, you know, in criminal institutions, they typically find there are more uh, mesomorphics than ectomorphs or mesomorph endomorph combinations than ectomorphs. But these findings really aren't very large in magnitude. And what's most, somewhat most important here is you need to be really careful here about attributing causality. So does this body type cause criminality? Um, Sheldon, you know, obviously wanted to say that, wanted to say that that was the case. But there are a lot of issues with causation here, and there could be many factors at play. You know, for example, it could be that mesomorphs are able to bully and use aggression to get their way because of their body type. You know, so it's not just because, so just because they have this body type, they're allowed to kind of use those, those means to get what they want. But also it's entirely possible that, you know, once people go into these institutions, they tend to work out more and there's a lot of fitness going on. Uh, so in other words, you know, someone might enter into an institution as an ectomorph, but uh, they might look more like a mesomorph by the time Sheldon came around and measured them. But anyway, this particular theory um, was pretty popular uh, for a pretty long time there. And around the same time, or a little bit earlier uh, than the somatotyping, was going on, there was another big push in this country uh, that had to do with biology and crime, and specifically looking at how genetics interacted with crime. So specifically, I'm talking about uh, the eugenics movement here. And eugenics uh, translates into good in birth. And it's the name that we apply to societal attempts to purify the human race, um, by eliminating the unfit or uh, promoting the fit. So eugenics essentially tries to make the human race better by getting rid of quote unquote bad genes in the population. And in, um, well, from 1907 until like the 1960s, um, eugenic criminology was very popular. Uh, this was the belief, uh, the belief was that criminality was largely based on genetics and that the root cause of criminality um, was passed from one generation to the next generation in forms of uh, bad genes. So if you think about it, you know, if you think that a criminal is carrying bad genes, then the one thing you would want to do is keep them from passing those genes on and then eventually uh, you can purify the human race. That was kind of uh, the thought process there. So within uh, the eugenics movement, there were two pieces that were important. So one was negative eugenics, which is what I was just kind of going over. So this is the idea that a nation can save itself by preventing the reproduction of the unfit, those with the bad genes. But then there's also positive eugenics. And so simultaneously, this involves encouraging the fit 
those with quote unquote good genes, uh, to produce more offspring. So at the same time, you want to prevent criminals from reproducing, you want to get the quote unquote good people in society uh, to have more kids. So you might enact policies, um, you know, such as giving them tax breaks for having more and more children. So let's look at the American eugenics movement. Um, so it went from 1907 to uh, 1939, but there were remnants of the eugenics movement long after 1939, um, as I mentioned, kind of almost into the 60s. Um, but this was really the heyday period uh, for the American eugenics movement. And basically there was this push to get rid of criminality by sterilizing women who carried these bad genes or quote unquote bad genes. And um, Indiana was actually the first state to legalize forced sterilization in 1907. Uh, but many other states followed suit. And a majority of states, uh, 31, did end up passing mandatory sterilization laws. And these were known by, you know, a variety of names here. You can see sexual psychopath laws, uh, registration laws, etc. cetera. Uh, but the main point was to prevent women who carried these quote unquote bad genes from having children. And unfortunately, you can see easily um, where this type of movement could lead us. Um, and in fact, it, it did. Um, Actually, in fact, when Adolf Hitler came into power in Germany, um, later on he claimed that his idea of uh, genocide against the Jews was inspired by the American eugenics movement. Uh, so you can see how this could go awry very quickly. And in fact, it did in this country as well. If you look at, um, you know, who was sterilized during these years, they were mainly immigrants. Um, in fact, one of the names that was given to them was uh, the pigs. So Polish, Italian, Greek, and Slavic. And those, they, they were thought to have these bad genes. Um, or another group was known as the CIA, so the Catholic Irish Alcoholics. Um, again, th thinking that these individuals were carrying these bad genes. Um, and in fact, the Irish suffered the most during this movement, um, most likely. And the states uh, kept very poor records, uh, but it's estimated that approximately 750,000 Irish people were sterilized um, with this idea that Irish individuals carried quote unquote bad genes. You know, they committed crime and they drank and therefore they needed to be sterilized. And as you can see, although they were trying to prevent criminality, which is associated, uh, criminality in general is associated more with males than females, uh, the way that you prevent people uh, from sending their genes forward was actually to focus on these women and to sterilize the women. So let me give you an example of a case. And this is the case of Carrie Buck. Uh, so Carrie Buck was in an institution uh, for the feeble-minded um, in our country. Uh, basically, institutions for the feeble-minded feeble -minded, uh, were just a catch-all kind of institution for anybody that was thought to be mentally disabled. And so she was 18 years old and she was a patient in this institution. And she was there at the institution despite the fact that she'd had five years of schooling and she'd reached a sixth grade level of uh, academic competence. So in other words, um, she maybe was even more educated than a lot of women uh, during that time period. You can see a picture of Carrie Buck with her mother there. But uh, the head of the institution, uh, Dr. Pretty, recommended her for sterilization. And he maintained that she was a genetic threat to society. Uh, so they wanted to sterilize her. Uh, so what was her threat? 
okay, essentially, uh, the case against her was that her 52-year-old mother had three illegitimate children. Um, her mom was said to have a mental age of eight and to have a record of immorality. Um, in fact, the court documents say she had three children without good knowledge of their parentage. So I guess that was a fancy way of saying she didn't know who the dads were. Um, however, Carrie herself was adopted and she was given up as a teenager um, for being incor incorrigible. And so that's essentially what ended her up at the institution. Uh, the real thing was Carrie landed in the institution pregnant, and that was what was considered her incorrigible behavior. Um, so that's what ended her up in the institution for the feeble-minded. But the real thing um, was the fact that, uh, you know, she ended up pregnant. So basically, they were saying that Carrie was engaging in the same immoral behavior as her mother. You know, she was showing this pattern uh, from generation to generation of immorality. And by the way, uh, this case went to the court and was challenged. Um, and this went all the way to the Supreme Court. But as you could guess, before the court could actually decide on this sterilization decision of whether or not she should be sterilized, uh, Carrie actually gave birth to um, her daughter, who she was pregnant with. And um, the interesting thing is, so they claimed this incorrigible behavior, uh, but later on they found out that she was given up by her adoptive parents uh, because she was raped uh, by a nephew of the family. And so they wanted to basically get her out of the way. So anyway, uh, this particular case, as I mentioned, went all the way to Supreme Court in Buck versus Bell in 1927 and they finally ruled and what they did is they ruled against Carrie Buck and ruled in favor of forced sterilization. And this is a quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes who is often considered um, and a very smart jurist uh, but this is his quote in the Buck versus Bell case. We have seen more than once that the public welfare may, be call upon, may call upon the best citizens for their lives. It would be strange if it could not call upon those who already sap the strength of the state for these lesser sacrifices, often not felt to be such by those concerned, in order to prevent our being swamped with incompetence. It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, Society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from contributing their kind. The principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. Three generations of imbeciles is enough. So what three generations is Justice Holmes talking about here? Talking about um, Carrie's mother, Carrie, and Carrie's daughter, Vivian. So, you know, if you kind of break this apart here, uh, what he's saying is, you know, sometimes your country asks you to give up your life and it would be strange if people who already are drained on our society would make some lesser sacrifice. Um, and also interestingly, he mentions, he's basically arguing and saying that these people who are called uh, to make this sacrifice don't, don't really care. Um, and it's better for all the world to prevent um, instead of waiting to execute their children. And basically the idea that you can require people to vaccinate uh, their kids is broad enough to include the idea that you can prevent people from having children altogether. Um, so interestingly about this, you know, Carrie Buck and also her daughter uh, were both sterilized. And then later on in life, uh, Carrie was paroled from the institution and she worked as a domestic worker for a family in Virginia and she was an avid reader until her death in 1983. And her daughter Vivian uh, did really well in her two years of schooling. Um, one of those years she was actually on the honor roll, um, but unfortunately 
Vivian uh, died at the age of eight when she got sick and passed away. So you can see, you know, how our country has made some really drastic decisions about how to uh, prevent criminality based on some really iffy theories about what truly causes criminality. So let's fast forward a little bit here into the 1960s. And in the 1960s, uh, you know, the eugenics movement is really, really gone um, at this point, but there were some other theories that came about, about um, because of certain killers or mass murderers. And one thing that was very popular in the 60s was this idea of the XYY super male. So they found some male criminals um, had two Y chromosomes instead of one. So they were these XYY super males. And these individuals were taller than average. Uh, they suffered from acne because acne um, is caused by tes testosterone. Um, they had less than average intelligence. And they also found that this XYY super male was overrepresented in prisons and mental hospitals. And the poster child for this XYY super male uh, was Richard Speck. And in 1966, he systematically killed eight student, eight student nurses from a Chicago um, hospital slash university. And these were young women who were studying to become nurses who lived in this dorm. And one night he broke into the dorm and he tied nine of the nursing students up. And during the night, uh, he had sex with and killed uh, those women. And only one of the students survived. Um, you know, he had lined the girls up and tied them up and incapacitated them. Uh, but this one woman was able to roll under the bed and get away. And since he didn't really know how many women he had tied up, uh, she was able to survive. But uh, Richard Speck then became the poster child for this XYY super male. And for a while, everyone thought, uh, you know, this might be the answer. But this begs the question, you know, are all, crimin all criminals XYY super males? So, you know, even though they were rep overrepresented in prison, we found out this is not really a good theory of criminality because most people in prison and even violent offenders nonetheless were not this type of XYY super male. And they also pointed out the fact that these XYY super males tended to have below average intelligence and some suggested that this is why we saw them in prisons because uh, they were, you know, not smart enough and maybe more likely to get caught. But either way, anyway, uh, this particular theory went by the wayside uh, pretty quickly. So let's keep going a little bit further into the 80s. Um, we still haven't given up the possibility that there might be a connection between criminality and genes or genetic predispositions. And in the 80s, our scientific method um, became more refined and we were able to better test the possibility that genetics had something to do with crime and criminality. So for example, in the 80s, there were several researchers that started using what we, what we call twin studies. And the idea is, you know, if you look at monozygotic twins, so identical twins, they share 100% of their genetics. So what you wanna do is you wanna look at the concordance rate. This is the idea that so if one twin is a criminal, one of, if one of the identical twins, the monozygotic twins, is a criminal, what is the likelihood that the other twin is also a criminal? And so when you look at um, the concordance index or the concordance rate for monozygotic twins, um, it's about a 55% concordance rate for criminal or antisocial behavior. So if criminality was 100% caused by genes, 
then we would see a 100% concordance rate here, right? Um, because they share 100% of their genes. But you can see that that's not the case, that's not true. Um, however, that doesn't mean that there isn't any type of genetic component. Because if you look at the concordance rate for dizygotic twins or fraternal twins, um, it's much lower, it's only 13%. So, you know, when we see this pattern where the concordance rate is significantly higher for monozygotic twins compared to dizygotic twins, uh, this really does suggest that there is some type of genetic component. So more recent research has shown slightly varying concordance indices here, but uh, no matter the research, it consistently shows that there's always a higher concordance rate for identical twins uh, versus fraternal twins. So let's look at another way in which you can examine criminality uh, biological. So even uh, with twins, monozygotic or dizygotic, you can make the argument that, uh, you know, they're born into the same family and they're reared by the same parents so you can argue that, this that the environment might be playing a role here. And it could be that monozygotic twins are treated more similarly uh, by their parents than dizygotic twins, and that could explain uh, the differences in the concordance rates. So in order to rule out that possibility and kind of parse out the effects of the environment compared to genetics, uh, researchers use this cross-posturing cross study approach. So with this, you basically have this design. And by the way, many of these studies uh, were done in Denmark. And this is because Denmark keeps copious uh, health and criminal records on their adoptions. So what you have here is this two by two cross fostering study design. Uh, so you can see up here, you know, you can have a child that is born to a criminal. So the biological parents are criminal or born to a non-criminal. But those parents, these biological parents, uh, give up their child very early on. And then over here, you can see we have the foster parents. Um, now, obviously, you don't usually just hand children over uh, to foster parents who are known to be criminals, but in fact, sometimes they turn out to be. Um, so over here we have, on the top, we have the biology, and over here we have the environment, the foster parents were either criminal or the foster parents were non-criminal. So basically what you do is you look at how many of these children have criminal convictions, um, and you do this based on this two by two uh, design. So let's look at um, some of the results that were found here. This is a study done by Mednick in 1984. Um, he's someone that did a lot of these types of studies. And as I mentioned, you're gonna look at the percentage of uh, children with criminal convictions. And if you look at you know this table here, you can see that the biggest predictor of whether you will have a criminal conviction is not really what your foster parents are doing. It's rather based on the biology of your uh, actual biological parents. So it's really based, the biology is having a stronger effect here than the environment. So it's really about your biological parents rather than your foster parents, which is again, showing a link uh, between criminology, criminality and biology. So I've talked to you through a lot of different ways of looking at biology and crime, and um, nearly every study concludes that there is some type of genetic predisposition to crime. And studies have um, been replicated by outside research groups so other than that Mednick study that I just mentioned, there's others that have examined this. And we've also found similar results in multiple countries. So we find this connection between genes and criminality. 
But the problem is where we are right now. So we have this idea that there's something genetic that is being passed on, but we don't know what exactly is being inherited. You know, what is it? Is it some type of impulsivity that's being passed on that makes you more likely to be criminal? Um, you know, what exactly is going on here? Uh, just to give you an example of how crazy some of this can be. Um, let me show you this little picture here. So, well, scientists have known for more than a century that finger, la uh, finger length ratios differ between um, men and women. And specifically, we're looking at the pointer and the ring finger here. And for men, um, this ratio actually predicts how much testosterone uh, they were exposed to in the womb. So you're comparing the length of uh, your pointer finger and your ring finger. And so the shorter uh, the index finger relative to the ring finger here, the more prenatal testosterone someone was exposed to. And you can see this um, you know, by looking at this ratio and up here, and the more, you know, the more difference between these two fingers, the more this person was exposed to prenatal testosterone levels. And there was this new study that came out that was linking uh, this quotient, this ratio, to aggressive adult behavior. So again, it's really this idea of, you know, what is being inherited? Is, that, is it that some children get more testosterone, resulting in this weird ratio, which then predicts aggressive behavior? Uh, or is it something completely else? Uh, the fact of the matter is, we really don't know. Um, you know, we're talking about over 100 years of research here of how genetics might contribute to criminality. And while we do know that there is some type of connection uh, to this very day, we still don't know what exactly that connection is. So that's it uh, for the biological theories. And you will have two readings um, this week where you're going to be looking at the sociological theories of criminality and then the psychological theories of criminality next. Thanks.